stay on hand to give mentorship and give guidance for them on a day to day basis. So it becomes like you know very very you know very close working with them so that they feel nurtured and they feel uh, they can contribute and they get the confidence. Ladies and gentlemen, and of course the industry stakeholders who are here too. Um, I, I don't intend to make a long speech, there's obviously three other speakers after me. Um, but I would like to just make a few remarks in respect of the, the digital space. A few years ago when uh, digitalization or digitization came, in, came to the fore, it was hailed as the greatest equalizer between peoples. But it can also be the greatest disequalizer because the availability of digital technology, digital apps, uh, digital facilities must be available to everybody at an affordable price because you can create a huge gap between those who have access to, for example, internet, to those who have access to mobile phones or smartphones and those who don't. It creates an even bigger gap. So from government policy perspective, it is always our responsibility to ensure that the spread of digitalization or digital technology is made available to everybody equally. It, of course, has enormous challenges in small island states like Fiji, in particular when you have the population spread over 110 islands. You may have, for example, one island with two villages with only 50 people each. Vodafone and Digicel and other businesses, corporations, won't necessarily see a return on their buck if they go there. It's difficult because if you have to put a half a million dollar tower on one, uh, one island and there's only 50 people and they're using and they're spending only $10 a month, that's only $500 return on a half a million dollar tower. So this is where government comes in using universal service funds, for example, uh, where we have put in place various initiatives, whether it's fiscal initiatives, incentives to be able to ensure that people do get access to that technology. And as you know, with this technology, it's not only restricted to, for example, money transfer, which I'd like to come to later on, but it's also about you know, e -med uh, medical services, about e-education. And if you have students in Suva, Latoka, Nandi, having access to e-education, but somebody, a child in remote Yasawas or Lao, southern eastern Lao or Kandavu, not having access to that, you're creating even big, bigger gap between them and those who live in the urban centers. And that's where essentially, as it's called, uh, you know, within the corporate speak, you have the companies that cherry pick because they actually go to areas where they'll get a quick and very good rate of return. So again, we need to be able to provide or fill in that gap through various initiatives. We have seen the phenomenal spread of access to this technology from a mobile phone perspective only in the past 10 years. The rate of a phone call in Fiji only about 10, 12 years ago, peak rate was 99 cents a unit. Today, peak period is about 24 cents a unit, even cheaper. 10, 12 years ago, there's no such thing as five up, seven up, free text messages, free voice calls, etc. Now there is an accepted standard practice or standard product that our citizens demand. So it's phenomenally changed. What it also has meant is that we need to keep up to pace with this technology really quickly and need, need to learn to adapt to it. And how do we in fact offer services uh, through using this technology? In, in, uh, to give you a recent example, with COVID-19, which is of course now we have the new norm, um, whatever the new norm would be, because obviously it's changing on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. We have disbursed close to $500 million of which $50 million has been, for example, in, in subsidies like you know, access to free electricity, water, market vendors' fees, fishers' fees, etc. But in terms of unemployment benefits, about $450 million, of which about $220 million has been disbursed, at least, through the money wallets. The, the application time, or the time it took a person to apply through the M-Pesa platform or MyCash platform through the, uh, the application uh, window 
It took them three minutes to apply. And then the monies were disbursed, and we had disbursed, for example, in one round of the 360, a hundred million dollars was disbursed in about three or four days. It is phenomenal that that's actually happened. Not just the disbursement of the fees, but the fact that you had people who could actually sit in the comfort of their home, or their shop, in the village, wherever they were, in the comfort of their bus that they were traveling in, and be able to make that application. That is actually quite incredible. Funds have been in other countries, of course, disbursed through digital means, through money wallets, but applications, many countries, people actually have to go and queue up, stand for a few hours, fill out forms, and then have access to money through the money wallets. In this particular case, we've actually had applications electronically also. So it's really set a new, new paradigm, if you like, in Fiji. And going forward, of course, it's been able to give us the uh, access to data that previously we did not have access to. It helps you to, and this is one of the wonders of this technology, it helps you to actually better plan. We know, for example, how many women applied. We know how many people between the ages of 18 and 25 applied. Where did they apply from? Were they in Nasinu? Were they in Ba? Were they in, you know, Lawanga in uh, Singatoka? So that level of access to information is critically important in future planning. So we can actually collaborate, whether it's the Ministry of Rural Maritime Development, whether it's Ministry of Education, whether it's Ministry of Commerce, Trade and Tourism, to be able to use that data to provide better services. And again, it feeds into what we are launching here today. I mean, this is going to be an incubator here where you'll allow, I assume, not just young, but also older people who probably can apply uh, to have the incubation done here, where they could actually develop apps given the fact that we now have this sort of footprint of technology access throughout Fiji, to be able to provide new products, to make their lives a lot easier. And I think that's critically important because it's not just about the technology itself, but it's about the products that you'll be de delivering through that technology. And I think that's what we, uh, you know, we'd like to see. We have in the, in the budget just announced that, uh, I'm sorry, in August that was announced, or came into effect in August, uh, a number of incentives have been, uh, for example, offered uh, to people investing in the ITC uh, uh, space, uh, people setting up BPO in the BPO space, uh, the various tax incentives for that. We've also uh, have made an announcement regarding uh, Telecom Fiji, where they intend to develop an uh, ITC park also, where they will not only have companies come and set up, but also in respect of providing, we've said as part of the agreement, for them to be able to get that uh, tax incentive to provide something similar to what is being launched here on a bigger scale. And you know, M-Pesa was mentioned by Sanaka. I mean, M-Pesa was actually a locally grown app, uh, which has obviously, you know, been uh, quite uh, phenomenally successful. Uh, correspondent banking is an issue for a number of uh, countries in the, in the Pacific. Uh, Samoa, we know, uh, every time we used to go to the World Bank, the number of challenges in respect of people being able to send money from offshore. You now see in Fiji's case, a lot of Fijians or friends and families and relatives are now sending money actually through M-Pesa. The Reserve Bank has recently released some statistics. The growth in that area has been quite, quite, you know, quite amazing. One area that, you know, which I could sort of use this occasion uh, to uh, talk about is that how a number of businesses actually have not latched on to this opportunity. Of course, a lot of that has been driven now. So for example, restaurants, etc., you can perhaps order online, get the food delivered. But I'm talking about you know, entities like hardware companies. Uh, I'm talking about entities like uh, you know, the mom and dad bakery down in Samambula or Nambua, or somebody who's, who's got a florist shop. The ability for them to be able to access or be able to sell their products online uh, using money wallets, uh, I think it is a huge space for that. So in this year's budget, for example, we are subsidizing those costs, M-Pesa costs for shops, for example, if they um, get M-Pesa facilities, we are paying for that. We are also working with Vodafone in respect of the VT Cut, um, you know, platform. Again, through government itself now, I mean, I, I was told a horror story some, you know, some time back where somebody was at uh, one of the government hospitals and it was late at night and they wanted the uh, you know, the, the relative um, admitted and they wanted one of those rooms where you actually pay for it, the paying ward. And they said, well, you have to pay, you know, $300 up front. 
And they said, okay, you know, I've got my ATM card. I said, well, you know, we don't have an ATM machine or we don't have an FPOS machine. You now have to go down to the uh, ATM machine downtown and take out the $300 and then come and pay us and we take cash. Now, if I don't have a car, if there's a curfew, what do I do? Will my relative get admitted or not? So we have, you'll notice again in this year's budget, we're rolling out FPOS machines throughout all the government, key government agencies, and at least initially like uh, hospitals, health centers, lands department, LTA, and they've already got those machines, but other government departments where they actually take money, whether it's BDM, etc. So that is actually, you know, doing, uh, we, we're spreading the ability of people's ability to use that technology. And I think it is critically important. Last point I would like to make, of course, is that once you sort of made the technology or the, uh, the, the technology available in a very basic form, we need to be able to move on to the next level of how do we use that technology for further advantage, to be able to improve and to be able to empower people. We have, for example, there's about 95 to 96% coverage of people who have access to mobile uh, voicemail or internet connection. There's the last 4 or 5% that we are wanting to connect. As again announced in the budget, we have a program called the Connecting the Unconnected. We have a number of projects, for example, in Vanualevu. I think there's about 24 sites uh, that we should get completed by end of December. Uh, sorry? before the end of November, which is only in a few days' time. So, uh, again, we'll have these people and getting access to technology. We are connecting health centers, we are connecting schools, and, of course, the people living around those schools. I think the, the next stage now is of, of the, uh, able to integrate that with government services, to be able to integrate government services together with the private sector to make people's lives a lot more easier, for them to be able to access information and technology, be able to uh, access services. And that can only be done if we have that intellectual input into developing those products. So getting back to our launch here today, I think it's critically important that we have this facility here. We urge those who are uh, you know, uh, keen in this area, those you may know, young people and older people who are quite keen to do so, please tell them to do so. I asked the question as we came in uh, that who, who will own the intellectual property. I'm assured those who actually develop it will be the ones who own the intellectual property, and that's obviously critically important. So uh, once again, thank you to uh, the UN, uh, of course, our friends at the, the Forum in Australia uh, for participating in this space and, of course, providing the funding. I think there's a number of uh, you know, interesting uh, uh, features that will be coming out in the next one year. For example, you're looking at you know, issuing a blue bond. Uh, we need to ensure that there's actually tracking of that when, because when people actually buy your bonds, for example, they bought the green bonds, they want to know that the money is actually being spent in that particular space. We can have, you know, these blockchain uh, areas that we can use to be able to know exactly where the money is going, where is the mangrove planted, where is the seagrass, what is being harvested, where is the fish coming from, is it coming from an ecosystem or biodiversity that has recently been, you know, put in place there's a number of opportunities in that space, including, of course, with the Climate Change Act now. And, of course, many people had lamented about COP26 without actually knowing anything about it. But there's a number of uh, positive outcomes that have come out of COP26. And then riding on the back of the Climate Change Act, I mean, carbon trading, you know, we're looking about carbon offsets, number of opportunities, and I hope that the... The, the people who will be coming here and developing these uh, products, that they can actually take advantage of that and look into the, the, the climate change space and the opportunities that it presents to them. So, Vinaka Vakalewa to all those who have been involved, and I wish this center success. Vinaka, thank you.